It's just a Wednesdays now instead of Thursdays. All right. We are still in the parables of Jesus. So last week, we were going through five parables that had to do with planting things. And one of the comments I made last week was I think all those parables are telling the same story. They're just different chapters kind of building on each other. I left off two parables at the end, partly because I didn't have time, but also because they're kind of an interesting wrap-up to the things that Jesus was teaching. So let's very quickly highlight the five parables we went over last week. First was the parable of the sower. And this is the sower sows a seed. It falls on all different kinds of ground. And the idea here is that the seed is the truth or it's the word of God. And then it falls into cultivated hearts and there it flourishes. There's other things that can make it so that doesn't happen. Hard hearts um, where thorns of life are growing up and choking it out. Uh, stony soil, and they're all just metaphors for a way in which the truth that God gives to us does not grow in our hearts. So the first parable is you want a cultivated heart so that the truth of God grows, grows well. The second one had to do with weeds and wheat growing together in the same field, and I think this is a caution for us to remember that there's more than one sower at work in our lives and in the world, and people are competing for that fertile ground in our hearts and in our societies and then the weeds and the wheat, they grow up together. And Jesus' encouragement or his admonishment is don't try to destroy them. Uh, identify, be discerning so you know what's true and what's false. But as we saw later in the parables, and this is where parables, you sometimes have to step out of the imagery a little bit. In this case, the, wheat, or the weeds could become wheat. So be patient. God's still at work. Uh, meanwhile, just be wheat. If that's what you are, just be faithful to God in the midst of whatever circumstance. And the parable of the seeds was just about a farmer who planted seeds, and he just went through his life, and these things grew into this great plant, and he had, didn't understand it and really had nothing to do with it. It's just a reminder that God's at work in us, that when he plants the seed into our lives, he is there helping it to grow and nourishing it. And then the next one, the parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of God with all the people is growing into this huge tree, this spiritual tree that becomes so huge that it provides shades to all kinds of people. It's not just the people of God, but everybody benefits when the kingdom of God is flourishing. And so much so that these birds who showed up in the first parable that were evil, they're now showing up and now they're resting in the tree. They saw the compelling nature of it and they are finding rest there. And the last thing was parable of the yeast. You, you don't need a lot of people to really make the kingdom take off. And we talked about how in the early church, just the way in which it grew was remarkable. Like it had no business growing that fast. But Jesus said it would. So that all sounds great. And if I'm the disciples and the other people listening, I'm sitting there thinking, this is fantastic. Like we're part of this movement that's gonna, it's going to go global, it's going to be organic, it's going to grow slow and steady, the, the weeds aren't going to stop it, and if you're the disciples, you're like, yeah, uh, we're, the, we're the wheat, you know, <laughs> we're, we're on the front end of this, and, and this is great, we're going to, in a sense, take over the world, maybe, the, I mean, the zealots weren't happy, because it wasn't a battle, physical battle, but this really sounds compelling, and then Jesus closes with two parables, a parable about a treasure, and a parable about parable about a pearl. This is from Matthew 13, verses 44 and 45. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that a person found and hid, that because of joy he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Don't get too hung up on the found and hid. Uh, at that time, this was a perfectly acceptable thing. Like often people might hide their treasure in the ground to keep it safe and then forget about it or they die or Somebody else finds it, and it was okay if you found that to go by the field, and then it was yours. So this isn't something nefarious. Uh, I'm not even sure we're supposed to read too much into it. It's just a story. It's like a treasure in a field. Because of joy, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. And when he found a pearl of great value, he went out and sold everything he had and bought it. So in other words, the kingdom of heaven is glorious. It's the greatest treasure you can imagine. It's the most perfect pearl you could think of. Maybe today we think more of diamonds. They're often quite famous. It's, it's the ultimate thing that you can find. And so that's fantastic. 
And then Jesus says, um, but if you want it, it's going to cost you everything. Because both people in these parables, they sell all they have. Everything else goes away in order for them to obtain this. And Jesus' point isn't that you can purchase the kingdom. I mean, over and over in Scripture, we are told that this is a gift that is given to us. We're brought into the kingdom by grace. Uh, in Luke, Jesus says, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This isn't a parable about what you have to do to buy your way into the kingdom. It's just an analogy that makes the point being in the kingdom is going to cost you something. Luke records a time that Jesus was talking to a pretty large crowd, and uh, Jesus was pretty good about thinning crowds out. I don't know if you've, if you've read the Gospels much. You know he wasn't inclined to just try to say everything nice to boost his numbers. More often than not, he said stuff that almost certainly a lot of the crowd left. And here's a good example. This is from Luke 14. He says to this crowd, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and I want to note, this is a very Jewish way of speaking. Jesus didn't mean despise, and I think I have the definition up there. It just means you esteem one more than the other, or you're going to renounce one for the sake of the other. If anyone comes to me and does not do that with father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He's, just, he's talking about allegiance. That if we agree to follow Jesus, Jesus gets preeminence. There's nothing else in life that, if this is Jesus, nothing else in life is going to rise higher than where Jesus is in our lives. He's the center of that treasure. He is the pearl. It's the foundation for all of those things. And things have to be given up for this treasure. So Jesus in Luke 14, after he says that, he tells two stories. He gives an analogy of a builder. They're going to count the cost before they start to build a build project. Then he talks about someone going to war. They're going to count the cost before they go to war to see if this is actually something they're going to be able to do. And then he says in Luke 14, those of you who do not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciples. So the availability of the kingdom to us comes at great cost. That's the cost of Jesus' life. The experience of the kingdom in our lives will be a costly trade for us as well. We're going to have to trade the priority and the love of everything else. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of ways to talk about that. We have to trade away anything that does not give preeminence to Jesus in every area of our life. And I'll go back to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So Jesus is talking in these parables about the pearl and the treasure very specifically. Is this your treasure? Is this where your heart is? Because if it is, you need to know what you're getting into. Like Count the cost if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. So let's clarify what that treasure is. And this is just my definition. You can find lots of other definitions. This isn't scripture. It's my attempt to summarize. I think the treasure is the spiritual state where we surrender heart, soul, mind, and strength to the grace-filled reign of the king, Christ Jesus. The Bible uses a lot of language to describe our relationship to Jesus. Or, or we have God the Father. Jesus is our friend and our brother. And a language, another analogy that's used is kingship, which is a a word we're not used to. I mean, democracies are very different from monarchies. But when we move into the kingdom, we move into a monarchy. Christ is king. So I'm noting it's a grace-filled reign of the king, Christ Jesus. It's us moving into that spiritual state. And because it's a spiritual state, you don't see this advance in any way other than the good news of the gospel. There's lots of ways to talk about morality and ethics and what it looks like to, to help individuals and cultures live better lives, quote unquote. But the kingdom of heaven advances through the preaching of the gospel. So it's not going to be found among nations on earth. It's not a country. It's not an empire. It's not a geographic area that's been Christianized. It's not Christian nationalism. The kingdom of heaven advances through the preaching of the gospel. And the citizens of the kingdom of heaven 
are those who have surrendered their heart, soul, mind, and strength to the grace-filled reign of the king, who is Jesus. I mean, Jesus said to his disciples when they tried to fight for him in the garden, he says, my kingdom's not of this world. Stop fighting like that. And I would note, I'm not talking about the future reign of God when he wraps up history, but that's a discussion for another time. I'm just talking about now, when, when Jesus said the kingdom is here now. So that's my definition for the kingdom. How do we advance it? How does it become this tree from the previous parable? The kingdom of heaven is advanced when those who have been saved, sanctified, that just means God's doing a work, and transformed increasingly into the image of Jesus, spread the good news of the gospel message of Jesus Christ in word and in deed. And then I think when we truly see and experience the treasure that's the kingdom rightly expressed, and I want to say that carefully, because it's possible to be a part of the church, which is kind of the embodiment, which is the local gathering of the kingdom. It's possible to be part of a church where your experience isn't great. So I'm choosing my words carefully here. But we see and experience the treasure that is the kingdom rightly expressed. The loss of all the things we have traded will be an exercise in joy. And I love this definition of joy. It's just grace recognized. And this is from uh, Helps Word Studies. You can look it up. Like joy, I don't know what you think of or what comes to mind when you think of the word joy, but it's directly connected with seeing the grace that God has given to us, recognizing it, and then responding to it. So when I, when I use joy for the rest of the sermon, I'm talking about grace recognized. Paul says it this way in Philippians. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ. I mean, that's pretty blunt language. I'm thinking of all the things I have gained in my life. Um, and if you're perhaps thinking of all the accomplishments that you have and the, the accolades you've received and the the stuff that's been accumulated or the honors that are on your wall. I mean, we could think of all these things, and Paul would tell us very bluntly, those things are garbage compared to knowing Christ. Like everything else pales in comparison. So let's talk about that kingdom. And let's talk about this kingdom rightly expressed or the ideal way in which we experience God's grace through this spiritual kingdom on earth. Peter talks about what should characterize those who are followers of the king. And if it's going to characterize the individuals, then it's going to characterize the group, right? Or it should. This is from 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I asked you to envision a church community that's characterized by this. We're participating in the divine nature. That doesn't mean we become gods. It, that's just part of this transformation as our, our, our very character increasingly reflects the character of Jesus. We're freed from corrupt, oh, evil desires. Oh, dear God, how beautiful does that sound? We have an increasing measure, faith and goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness, mutual affection. We like each other. Love, we sacrifice for each other. I mean, how does that not add joy to whatever sacrifice it costs us? And once again, that joy is grace recognized. We look around and we see God at work, not only in our lives, but the community of people we live with. 
And, and we trade everything else for the joy of Christ and living in the kingdom. And if that's really what's happening in these church communities, it, in our church, I mean, that's, that is an oasis of hope and peace and love in the desert of the world. I mean, it's, it's the be- beautiful vision of what God offers through Christ, not just for us individually, but for our church. And this joy that we experience won't be a cheap joy because it's not a cheap grace. Right? Living in this is going to cost us. Um, Peter just said, make every effort to add these things. So God's doing God's side work, but we're doing whatever God has given us to do. And so self-control is hard. This is where I ask for an amen. Self-control is hard. Are you with Is it just me? Self-control is hard. That was a pretty loud amen. So is perseverance. Perseverance is hard. Uh, love is hard. Mutual affection, these things are hard. But we experience the richness of the kingdom of God. But we're willing to offer what God has given to us in his grace into the service of the king uh, and under the reign of the king. So that's our gifts, our talents, our resources, all these types of things. Everything goes on the altar. And I think it was Paul who said, I die daily. And we've often joke about, if you're the sacrifice that climbs up on the altar, the tough thing is you can crawl right back off. So the tough thing is how do you keep yourself there and surrender yourself to the lordship of the king? And then the Bible tells us as we experience this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I think that's the recognition of a gracious God, how his grace is at work in us and his grace is at work around us and it gives us strength and we're going to need it because it can be hard. So let's make this practical. What are the things we have to sell, so to speak, in order to experience the goodness of the kingdom? And I started making a list this week, and I promise you this is a very incomplete list. You'll probably be thinking of more things as I'm talking or when I'm done. You'll probably be thinking, there's a lot more to say about that particular point, and you'll be right. We don't have Message Plus this morning, so I would just encourage you, it could be a conversation starter at lunch if you so choose. All right. First thing, we give up control and we surrender. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, y'all, when we sing together on Sunday mornings, that's worship. When we pray, when we read scripture, that's worship. Um, there, I could go into lots of different definitions of things that constitute a response from us that recognizes God at work in the world. But this is really pointed. Offer yourselves, offer your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And I think it's trading the kingdom of self for the kingdom of Jesus. If I, if I could use the analogy of like transferring the deed of a house. If I have a deed to my property, my life, I'm transferring that deed to God, knowing he's a better landlord. And not, he knows how to take care of this property in ways I don't. And not only that, he's a king. I remember the song, Jesus Take the Wheel. I heard that. It's Really, it's Jesus Take the Whole Car. Right? I mean... I, I love this song, but let's just be honest. We're not just hands off. Yeah, he gets the whole thing. That's the call of discipleship. As we transfer the ownership of our lives to a king, and we do it willingly, nobody's going to coerce you. But we recognize that when we do this, now the deed to our life is not our own. I remember the years that I was struggling to kick a pornography habit. I had a conversation with someone one time, and they just said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. And they said, when, when you're facing that choice about what you're going to click on, that choice has been made for you by your king. Like, oh, you're right. Um, when I entered the kingdom 
and I accepted the lordship of Christ, there were decisions that were made for me if I'm going to truly surrender. And that's, we could do a whole sermon on this. We transfer the deed of our life. We are not our own. We are not our own, but we're followers of Jesus. We transfer pride for humility. Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Listen, this doesn't mean you should be full of self-loathing or think more lowly of yourself than you ought. I think sometimes that can be translated to holiness is me constantly going around saying to myself, what a loser I am. That's not this point, the point. The point is seeing yourself honestly. And I think part of that is we learn to be okay with not being amazing. We learn to be okay with not even being great. We learn to be okay with not being okay. And that can be physically, emotionally, spiritually. And when I say we learn to be okay, I don't mean we settle somewhere. I just mean we learned that it's okay if I'm in this place, God is still at work, and I can tell people around me what I'm going through. And, it, and if we're in a kingdom community, it'll be safe. They'll link arms with us. We'll walk through it together. Right? It's trading pride for humility. It's letting yourself be known warts and all. And there's freedom and growth and honest self-assessment. And that usually happens in a transparent and honest community that is safe. That something we've experienced uh, this year in our the small group that we're in, our weekly practice is a practice of in some ways seeking to do this. We wouldn't label it like this in particular, but it's, it is just sharing where we're at in life. The good weeks, the bad weeks, the successes, the struggles, the failures, the frustrations, all of those things, learning to learning to get over ourselves and letting ourselves be part of the community God has placed around us to help us walk through life with integrity. So we trade pride for humility. We trade independence for interdependence. Romans 12, 4 to 5, for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, I, I want to note, that doesn't mean that our individuality is obliterated. Any Star Trek fans in here? Like the Borg, that kind of, yeah, Star Trek. Um, the real sci-fi fans, Star Trek fans. Um, yeah, our individuality is not obliterated. Our differences actually matter because we're all contributing, right? We don't all become the same. We just recognize we're part of something bigger than ourselves, and it's important. So I like puzzles. By the time I finish a puzzle, the individual pieces weren't obliterated. They were all individual and unique, but they were all fitted into the bigger picture. And they, the bigger picture would not have been complete without them, and they wouldn't have understood their role without the bigger picture. Does that make sense? Like they both fit together. We trade independence for interdependence. Number four, we trade a life hyper-focused on self to a life focused on others. And I said hyper-focused for a reason. Um, I think it's important that, I think self-care is a biblical thing. We have to take care of ourselves. Um, and we can, we can burn ourselves out if we're not careful. So I'm trying to choose my words carefully. We trade a life hyper-focused on self to a life focused on others. Here's Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on then. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. We just note, virtually everything up there has to do with other people. Right? Kindness is toward other people. Humility is, 
that's personal, but it's also in the context of being humble with others. We're patient with others. We bear with one another. We forgive others. We love others. It, it's similar to the previous point about our interdependence. It's similar to that. It once again doesn't obliterate our individuality. I mean, part of stewardship of what God has given us is stewarding our own health. And it's important because we want the body to be healthy. And in some ways, it's really important that we seek to spiritually, emotionally, relationally be healthy as we're part of that body. So I'm, I'm not telling you to um, undermine your spiritual walk and spiritual health because you, just, you do too much, right? Boundaries are a thing. This is just about us seeing ourselves as being part of a body. We seek to keep our part of the body healthy because we contribute it into the broader body and it participates in keeping the whole body in harmony. The fifth thing we do is we trade rights-based living for responsibility-based living. Two verses, Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. In other words, we've been given freedom so that we can serve effectively. Matthew 10, 45, even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we often talk about, when we, when we as Christians talk about freedom, it's two things. We've been freed from the power of sin. And we have been freed up to be the kind of person God intends for us to be. And whenever our exercise of freedom hurts us or hurts others, it's not being used as God intended freedom to be used. Because we're designed to use our freedom in loving service filled with truth and grace to those around us. Uh, probably the classic chapter on this is 1 Corinthians 8. And Paul is talking to the church in Corinth and he starts off the chapter saying, Listen, we all possess knowledge. Seems like a good thing. But knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So he's going to add something to go with knowledge because knowledge by itself, it just gets in your head. You're going to have to have love to temper the knowledge that you have. And here's the example he gives. He starts talking about this issue in the church where people didn't know if they were supposed to eat meat that had been offered to idols. As I understand it, because there's different opinions about this, people would take sacrifices into the temples of the pagan gods and not all that meat would be used, and they'd turn around and sell it in the marketplace. And some Christians were like, listen, those aren't even gods. It's just meat. We can eat it. And other Christians were like, yikes, that was set aside for this God, and if we eat it, we're compromised. Okay, so that's the danger. So Paul says, be careful that the exercise of your rights, and this is a reference to those who felt free to eat the meat, does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, and in this case, about what's sin and what's not. They see you eating in an idol's temple. Won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Y'all, I think we live in a culture where it's easy for us to go, hey, listen, if I feel free to meet, eat meat, I'm going to eat meat, you get over it. That is not the advice Paul gives here. If, if, if I have freedom to do something that causes a brother or sister to fall into sin, uh, then I need to remember that God has given me the freedom to help them avoid stumbling, even if it means curbing my rights. So yeah, when our, when our freedoms or our rights harm us or harm others, it's not what God had in mind. And now, envision, if you will, a community of God's people who are constantly aware of this. How do I serve? How do I love well? What might I have to, what freedom that I feel might I have to curb so as not to cause my brother or sister to stumble? This comes back to the interdependence, to being that one piece of a puzzle in a broader picture. It comes back to love and service. I mean, these are all going to kind of intertwine in some fashion. We trade hard-heartedness for repentance. 
1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just. He'll forgive us our sins. It'll purify us from all unrighteousness. But in order to confess our sins, we need to own our sins. We have to be honest about the things that we're doing. And in fact, in the kingdom, it is honorable and it's noble to confess your sins. I know this isn't a culturally, we're often told you put on your best front, you don't show weakness, don't let there be a crack in the armor. But listen, in the kingdom, you acknowledge your cracks in the armor, and you tell people about them. doesn't mean you have to shout it from a rooftop, but find a trusted friend or two. In the kingdom of God, that is noble and good and praiseworthy to own our weaknesses and to own our sin. And when we do that, it's actually a display of the power of God at work in us. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit's doing good work, that we're able to be humble enough to do these things. And it may be embarrassing, it may be humbling, but 1 John 1, 9 says there's purity of heart on the other side of this. That feels like a good trade-off. And if we're going through this process of repentance and forgiveness, hopefully there's restored and renewed relationship on the other side of it. That sounds like a good trade-off. Number seven, we trade vengeance for justice guided by mercy. Two passages. First from Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. Do not take revenge. And revenge, if you look up word definitions, probably the simplest definition is full vindication. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge, that is, bring about full vindication. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. And then Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. So in the kingdom, we give up the right to full vindication when someone wrongs us. That, that's different from saying that justice is an important thing to have in place in the world. Okay, so there's a principle of sowing and reaping that God himself put into the world, and actions have consequences. We're, we're not talking about getting in the way of true justice. Like if someone burns my house down, I can forgive them and give up the right to have full vindication on my terms. Like, I'm not going to go burn their house down. That's different from me reporting it to the police and watching justice play out, right? This is about exacting justice ourselves or getting full vindication on our terms for how we feel we have been wrong. We give up the right to make people pay like we want them to pay. We actually have freedom, and that is we know because God is a just God, that even if full vindication does not happen, even if justice plays out in a terrible way, it hasn't escaped the notice of God. And, and there's some freedom there. You know, a lot, of, a lot of popular action movies are revenge movies, right? Where someone gets something happens and they burn down the world to get the kind of revenge that they want. And they're exciting to watch. And they can be very entertaining. And Jesus says, that is not the way it works in the kingdom. We pursue justice. We give up the right for vengeance. God will have the last word. Two more. We give up self-indulgence for self-control. This is a long passage from Galatians chapter 5, beginning of verse 16. Here's my instruction. Walk in the Spirit. Let the Spirit bring order to your life. If you do, you'll never give in to your selfish and sinful cravings. For everything the flesh desires goes against the Spirit. Everything the Spirit desires goes against the flesh. There's a constant battle raging between them that prevents you from doing the good you want to do. It's clear that our flesh entices us into practicing some of its most heinous acts, participating in corrupt sexual relationships, impurity, unbridled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, arguing, jealousy, anger, selfishness, contentiousness, division, envy of others, good fortune, 
drunkenness and drunken revelry and other shameful vices that plague humankind. So think of that list as just living an unboundaried and uncontrolled and self-indulgent life. I told you this clearly before, and I, I tell you this again, so there's no room for confusion. Those who give in to these ways will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit produces a different kind of fruit, unconditional love, joy, peace, patience, kind-heartedness, goodness, faithfulness. And now I ask you, it's better. I'm going with the second list. I mean, that's the treasure. That's the pearl. We trade, up all, the, we trade all those other things for this one. Because God has our flourishing in mind as he designed us to flourish. And when he gives us the kingdom and he gives us the boundaries of the kingdom and everything that's in it, it's so that we have access to the life that we've been designed to live. And when we stay, when we live within that kingdom, it's not just good for us, it's good for everyone around us. Look at this list. Love, joy, peace, patience, that whole list. Okay, it's not just good for me if that characterizes my life. It's good for my wife and for Vincent if that characterizes my life. And it's good for all of you if that characterizes my life as a pastor, right? It, there's this ripple effect. And when that characterizes the kingdom, oh, that's a treasure. That's a treasure. Last one. We give up grudges for forgiveness. Be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, I don't know how you feel about the forgive and forget, but I don't think this is telling us to forget everything that happens because sometimes it's important that we remember patterns in people's lives so we know how to put up the right boundaries, right? Boundaries are a thing. And it's different from saying consequences shouldn't play out. Once again, things get sown and things get harvested from what's sown, and that's part of justice. So it's not denying justice either because one can hold tough boundaries with a gentle heart. It's just letting go of that grudge, that bitterness, that anger. It's stopping people from living rent-free in your head, right? It's letting go of that, and that probably comes back to um, God has got our back. And if things don't play out like we want them to play out now, it hasn't escaped the notice of God. So in the end, I, I just keep coming back to this imagery of transferring the deed of my life. And I, I know what that looks like with a car, with a boat, with a house. I mean, for the most part, if you're old enough to have signed any of those kinds of things, you understand what it means. Suddenly that boat isn't yours. It's somebody else's to make decisions about. Suddenly that house isn't yours. It's someone else's to make a decision about. And, it, and maybe... This might be a good analogy for what, what we mean when we say we want to become a Christian or we want to follow Jesus. So we're signing over the deed to this, this house. We're giving it to the rightful king and saying, it's yours. I trust you. I believe in who you are. Uh, and I need you as the ruler of this life because, well, for all the reasons. And the trade-off we get, I mean, that's the cost, right? The trade-off we get is the kingdom. And what we read about it, what characterizes what God does in us as individuals, and then ideally what begins to happen in the community of the people we're with. Uh, I mean, Jesus is clear. The kingdom of God is worth it all. And I find that incredibly compelling as I see what God's design is. And I also find it incredibly challenging because my question is, does the little outpost of the kingdom that we're creating here in our church, does it feel like a treasure? Right? Does it feel like the pearl of great price? And I... Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm mad at anybody. <laughs> it's just a reminder. That's the promise. That's the promise. And the more the king is at work in our lives and is at work in this church, 
the more the great treasure that he has given us is going to shine like a treasure should. The more that pearl that's been given to us is polished and gleaming. And so, Lord, my prayer is several things this morning. One is, I pray that all of us are drawn by your grace into your kingdom. Um, May the beauty of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and the glorious nature of the life that he offers to us and the, the forgiveness of sins and the transforming of all the things into us, Lord, I pray that that vision is compelling, that all who hear it will enter in. Lord, I pray that those of us who have signed over the deed of our lives, may we take seriously the kingship of the king and the privilege and responsibility of the kingdom. And Lord, I pray that as we do that, that we taste and see that the Lord is good, that we experience what you have designed your kingdom on earth to be. And then, Lord, I pray to whatever degree it's within our ability to do so, may we add on all those things that we talked about. May all the fruit of the Spirit flourish in us as we practice righteousness so that this kingdom is a shining city on a hill in a world that is so dark. Uh, Lord, we cannot do this without the miraculous work of your Holy Spirit, the truth of your word. Um, Do the work in us we can't do. And may your glory be clear to all who see us as individuals and see at this church. May it be obvious that God is doing miraculous work in the lives of people. And may your name be made great.